In this video, we continue with section 7.4, applications of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So we are going to take a look at quadratic forms and see how we can use the eigenvalue matrices associated with quadratic equations to solve some optimization problems. So eigenvalues and eigenvectors can be used to solve the rotation of axes problems that we solved in section 4.8. So recall that when we classified the graph of a quadratic equation, it was in this form uh, with coefficients a through f corresponding with the coefficients for the x squared, xy, y squared, x, y, and f terms. And these are set equal to zero in our standard form for the quadratic equation. If you've got some non-zero value there, remember you just move it over to the other side to create constant f. So this rotation we saw was fairly straightforward as long as the equation has no x, y term. So as long as b constant equals zero. If the equation has an x, y term, however, then the classification is accomplished most easily by first performing a rotation of axes that eliminates the x, y term. That's what we did in chapter four. The resulting equation relative to the new uh, x prime and y prime axes ends up in this form that we saw with no uh, x, y term there. So in this case, we are going to see that the coefficients a prime and c are the eigenvalues of this matrix here. It's known as matrix A, where the entries in the first row are a and b over 2, and the entries in the second row are b over 2 and c. And so this familiar expression ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared is a quadratic form that's associated with the whole equation, but that we uh, think of as a quadratic part of that. And notice uh, matrix A that we call the matrix of the quadratic form is a symmetric matrix. So we're gonna be using that in the proof of why we're able to do optimization calculations. And then it's also important to note that matrix A is diagonal if and only if you have zeros for the B over two values. So if and only if B is zero, which means that the corresponding quadratic equation has no x, y term. So let's take a look at what it means uh, when we talk about constrained optimization. And we've got this diagram, figure 7.6 over here at left that will help us understand this. So many real life applications require you to determine the maximum or minimum value of a quantity subject to some constraint. So for instance, consider a simplified example in which you need to find the maximum and minimum values of the quadratic surface f of x, y equals nine x squared plus five y squared along the curve formed by intersection of the surface with the unit cylinder x squared plus y squared equals one. So that's shown over here in figure 7.6. So the constraint is the unit cylinder, the equation x squared plus y squared equals one. So we can take a look here and see the maximums occur here and here when x equals positive one or negative one. And the maximum value there on this curve is a nine. So z is nine here at the maximum. And then the minimum values, I'll switch to red to circle those, occur over here uh, when y is one or negative one and that corresponds to z being five. So the theorem below allows you to use the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix to solve these kinds of constrained optimization problems. So for quadratic form F and N variables with a matrix of the quadratic form A, subject to this constraint here that the norm of, or the distance for X squared has the B1, the maximum value of f is the greatest eigenvalue of a, and the minimum value of f is the least eigenvalue of a. So let's take a look at the proof here. So quadratic uh, form f can be written as x transpose ax, uh, where the matrix of the quadratic form a is symmetric. So a has n real eigenvalues counting the multiplicities. So some values may come up more than once, but when you tally everything up, incorporating the multiplicities, you get n. So we're going to call these lambda 1 through lambda n. And then we're going to order them. So we're going to assume lambda 1 is greater than or equal to lambda 2 all the way through uh, being greater than or equal to lambda n 
the equals part is of course because we may have eigenvalues with the same multiplicity that come up more than once. So now consider changing variables to x equals uh, matrix P multiplied by x prime, where x prime is uh, x1 prime through xn prime, uh, written as a column vector, so that's why we have the transpose here. And P is the orthogonal matrix that diagonalizes A. So then using our matrix properties, we can work through x transpose AX, uh, substitute that as px prime transpose a px prime and then using the property of transpose with matrices uh, this becomes x prime transpose p transpose a p x prime and then substituting in our eigenvalues here this is lambda of uh, multiplied by x1 prime squared plus lambda 2 multiplied by x2 prime squared all the way through over here at the end we have lambda n multiplied by xn prime squared. And then the norm of x squared down here is the norm of px squared is uh, px prime transpose multiplied by px prime. And then taking again our um, transpose property of matrices, we get x prime transpose p transpose px prime. And then the p transpose p cancel each other out because p is an orthogonal matrix. So remember orthogonal matrix p transpose is the same as the inverse. So this is now down here, x, trans, x prime transpose x prime. And then expanding that out, that's just um, x one prime squared, x two prime squared through xn prime squared. So that's why the transposes are here, right? So that x1 prime, x2 prime through xn prime when we multiply that by x1 prime, x2 prime through xn prime, right? The transpose multiplied by the non transpose form of the vector. That's how we get the squares over here of each term. And that's just the norm of x prime squared. And the norm of x squared is one. So the norm of x prime squared is also one. And then we can say lambda one equals lambda one multiplied by each uh, individual value of uh, the x primes here squared. And that's gotta be greater than or equal to uh, lambda one times each x one prime squared plus lambda two times x two prime squared through the lambda n multiplied by xn prime squared because we're pulling the squares out of the sum. So that's why these constants here are included. And so that's why we know the first computation has to be greater than or equal to, because remember lambda one is the greatest of the lambdas. So lambda one is greater than or equal to lambda two and so on, greater than or equal to lambda n. So the lambda one is factored out up here. And so that saying well, this is greater than or equal to lambda one through lambda two through lambda n multiplied by each term, because the lambda two through lambda n are at most the same as lambda one, and they could be smaller. And then that's greater than or equal to if we factored out lambda n multiplied by the x one prime squared plus x two prime squared through x n prime squared. And that's just lambda n here. So this shows that lambda one is greater than or equal to x transpose ax is greater than or equal to lambda n. So all values of f of x one through xn equal x transpose ax for which the norm of x is one lie between lambda one and lambda n. If x is a normalized eigenvector that corresponds to lambda one, then f of x one through xn equals x transpose ax equals x transpose lambda one x equals lambda one multiplied by the norm of x squared, which is lambda one, because the norm of x squared is one. So if x is a normalized eigenvector that corresponds to lambda n, then f of uh, x one through xn equals x transpose ax equals x transpose lambda n x is just lambda n times the norm of x squared of x squared is one, so this is just lambda n. So what we've shown is that f has a constrained maximum 
of lambda one and a constrained minimum of lambda n. So this is how we're going to be able to use our eigenvalues in our calculations. So let's take a look at two examples here. So in the first example, we are finding the maximum and minimum values and a vector where each occurs of the quadratic form subject to this constraint where z equals 3x1 squared plus 2x2 squared and the norm of x squared is 1. So we can write the quadratic form as a matrix. Uh, so here's our matrix A that's going to have coefficients 3, 0, and 0, 2. And so when we write it in the form x transpose AX, we've got x1, x2, uh, which is uh, x transpose as a row vector. I think I wrote it the other way around when I did it back here as a column in a row, but it should work out either way. Uh, A is uh, 3, 0, 0, 2. And x1, x2 now is a column vector. So uh, you can verify over here, as I did in Simpy, that the eigenvalues are 2 and 3. And then here's our eigenvector 0, 1, and 1, 0. And so then we know the constrained maximum of 3 occurs corresponding to this eigenvalue over here when x1 is 1 and x2 is 0. And the constrained minimum of 2 occurs over here corresponding with this eigenvalue when x1 is 0 and x2 is 1. So the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues tell us the constrained maximums and when they occur. Here's another example for us to check out. In this example, we're going to go through the same calculation. Uh, we're going to find the maximum and minimum values in a vector where each occurs of the quadratic form subject to this constraint where z is 6 multiplied by x1, x2. This is basically our 6xy, that's our xy term. And then the norm of x squared is 1. So the quadratic form now has this matrix A, where the 3s are on the uh, opposite diagonals because we just have a B term here. We don't have an A or C term. There's no x1 uh, squared and no x2 squared term. All right, so calculating out uh, x transpose AX is in this form here. And then we're going to find the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues for 0, 3, 3, 0 are negative 3 and 3. They both have multiplicity 1. So the eigenvector corresponding with negative 3 is negative 1, 1. And the eigenvector corresponding with lambda equals 3 is 1, 1. So the constrained maximum of three occurs when uh, x1, x2 equals one over root two, one, one. And that one over root two comes in because we have to norm this so that the norm is one. And so we've got one over root two comma one over root two for the maximum, which occurs at positive three. And then the constrained minimum occurs at negative three. And so that's at negative one over root two, one over root two. So you can see in this uh, example how we are able to use eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors to quickly find constrained maximums and minimums and where they occur. So you'll work out some similar problems to this in the discussion and lab assignments. So remember, head over to Simpy and have Simpy help with these calculations. You don't have to crank out the eigenvalues and eigenvectors by hand.